Hello, everyone. Nick is here to talk to us about uh, buying a new computer. So many of us, like me, my computer is getting to that point where it won't allow me to do anything uh, multitasking on a computer. So I need a new one. And I started looking and there's too many choices and I don't know what to do. So uh, I cried to Nick one day and then he's like, I'm going to do a presentation. And I'm like, cool. Um, so this is our last meeting of the spring. And so our next meeting will be in September, which I think I counted is like five months away, which is crazy. But Maybe that means we have five months of fun summer. I don't know. Um, so uh, Nick graduated from Ithaca in 2020, the best year. And he has put together a bunch of different computers by himself with people here and very collaborative in it, shot some videos of it. And now we are doing this kind of like, where do you start and how do you get like more and more advanced? So tiered system tonight. Um, so Nick, take it away. Cause I am rambling. That's all good. I was um, going to add it, add in a personal connection that I actually in 2020, bought some surplus computer gear to build a rig of my own off of Nick. Um, like so thank you again. Nick. Really helps me out, but it's, uh, it's time to build another. Oh, one. I can imagine. Yeah, no, I, uh, I like to call it a little black market deal. We did. Um, <laughs> it helped, helped me. Out I really. watched Nick make his computer. That's true. In 2020. Too. Wait, did I did you... film it too. Was this the trade for eggs? Yeah, I gave, oh I gave yeah some... yes it was those eggs were delicious <laughs> i remember eating them the next day farm fresh they were amazing um well okay hi everybody um yeah i graduated a while ago i'm old um so i mostly work in post so computers and that sort of stuff is very important so i kind of had to learn this stuff right when i was graduating because i wanted my laptop wasn't really cutting it and I needed to know kind of what what I wanted, what I needed to be able to um, do my job or do a job. I didn't have one when I built it. Um, just a little, little intro. Um, basically, I'm going to break it down in terms of job type because the technology you'll need depends on what you need to use it for if you can get away with spending less money because your job isn't as demanding technolo technologically uh please do so <laughs> um and also as a disclaimer just because a lot of these will get into like costs and money and stuff just because some of this will get expensive does not necessarily mean it is better for that person so like a macbook air for a writer is perfect for them and that is a very good value and a very good deal but like a $5,000 gaming PC is not ideal for them. So I'm not, this is not better or worse in terms of usage. It's just better or worse in terms of performance of the technology. Um, okay, so I've broken it down um, into four little tiers here. So we've got office, office management and writers, anyone who uses um, like the Microsoft suite a lot, your email, uh, yeah, Final Draft, and is it Celtics or Celtics? I've heard both, both writing softwares. Um, then you're going to be in my tier one here. Uh, tier two is your producer coordinator who's mostly reviewing footage, looking at stuff, playing back, uh, giving live notes. Um, you'll probably be using Frame.io, ShotGrid. Avid, if you need to organize things sometimes, I know there's a couple um, producers I know who use Avid. Of course, Airtable, I had to put it in here. Um, then from two to three is kind of a big leap in terms of technology. Um, but we go straight to a mostly, mostly video editing or photo editing um, and graphic design, light 2D animation. And then our final tier, which is the biggest 
is going to be any 3D modeling, any heavy VFX work, anything using Maya, After Effects, Houdini, Unreal Blender, Flame, Duke Fusion, all that good stuff, and many more that I didn't name. Um, anything that's really intense on your computer uh, is going to be in that fourth tier. And I'm going to blast through this because I have a lot. Uh, number one, if you're a writer, the only thing to pay attention to when you are buying a computer is your CPU or your pro and your processor. They, those are the same thing. There's just two different names for it. Uh, CPU stands for Central Processing Unit. Um, in this tier, I'm assuming you're looking for portability and like ease of use. You're not trying to like do too much with your computer, but you need it to do the small tasks well, right? And you want to not be locked into a desk as I am here. You want to go to a coffee shop, you want to go to whatever, uh, this, this is for you. Um, tier two, you can go like either way with, it depends on how you work. If you want that portability, I would definitely lean towards a higher end MacBook Air um, or a lower end MacBook Pro, depending on what you do. Um, but if you like that desk kind of time and you have a space set up, then I would probably go for the IMAX. Um, but the important parts to pay attention to, uh, again, your CPU, um, your RAM, which is your random access memory. Uh, basically, for lack of a better definition, um, RAM determines how fast your computer can use applications and, and such. Um, I'll get into describing those parts in a minute. Um, and then your screen size is dependent on you and how what you like. Me personally, like if I had anything, like I have a 13 inch MacBook and I hate it because it's so small. <laughs> so if you like that bigger screen and you're reviewing footage, you might want to go with something larger. Um, any questions before I keep flying? No, great. Tier three. So this is where I would probably consider my my build here. Um, and there's a couple options you can you can go with. You can get away with a laptop being a video editor. However, the laptops that need the specs to do this job are going to be more expensive or equally as expensive as desktops and not provide the computing power that you would get out of said desktop. So I recommend personally in this kind of tier, a desktop. And a really good example of that is the, the Mac Studio, which came out, I think two years ago now. Um, really, really great. I don't own one. Um, really, really great desktop uh, alternative from the Mac Pro, which is uh, lovingly called the Cheese Grater. And you'll see it in a second because it looks like one. Um, the Mac Studio caps out at around like five thousand dollars, and for what it can do, based on the M2 chip, is like pretty good for that deal. Um, but then other costs you gotta think about is like whatever you're gonna get for your monitor. You have to have a mouse. You have to have a keyboard. Um, all that stuff comes built into the laptops. That um, it's something I know it sounds obvious, but like when I was building mine, I was like, oh, wait, I have to spend X on this and X on this when I didn't have to do that with my laptop. Um, for this, uh, I in my build, I can play back up to 4K resolution. I have played back 8K before and it's struggled. Um, so I wouldn't recommend any I wouldn't recommend this tier if you're dealing with 4k footage 24 seven all the time. Um, but it's good in like use cases. Um, yeah. And then a uh, new part has entered the chat here. Um, your, Oh my God, there is a chat that I'm not even opening. Hold on. Let me look at this. Okay, great. Um, yeah, GPU is your, I think it's graphics processing unit. Uh, very important for desktop. When you get into laptops, they usually combine them with the process, with the CPU. Um, and that's called integrated graphics. It's a little bit less powerful, but it depends on the chip you're getting. And we'll, we'll get into that in a minute, but, um, you're going to need a, a fairly beefy GPU to support 
um, playback. And then we get to the, the big one. Um, here's a cheese grater. Uh, this is like the cream of the crop in terms of computers. Very expensive, I will say. Um, but depending on the volume of work you get, you could probably pay this off in four, three or four months if you're working like professionally, depending on what you're doing. But um, yeah, I kind of threw this this custom build in there because there's not like for PCs, there's not like a, there's not usually like an off the shelf model I would recommend. There's a lot of like customization inside of it. So I just kind of, uh, mine does not look like this ugly giant over here. Um, yeah, I but, can't uh, get into the like, wide cases i don't know i'm just like old school. yeah I just, I just want like you know black maybe some glass to see inside of it to know what's going on but like I, the rgb lights can go away don't need those doesn't do it yeah. contrary to what the gaming pc like ads will tell you the rgb lights do not add processing power to your <laughs> your computer it's um, really hard to avoid them though, when you're buying it stuff. is it is and i'll get into that later uh with with custom stuff but um yeah it's annoying when you have to render something overnight and your computer is spewing like you know it's like a discotheque yeah yeah um important things to remember for this tier uh number one that is the biggest addition that is kind of essential is like a backup battery um so when your power goes out inevitably and you're working on something you have probably between like 10 to 30 minutes to save everything, close it out before like you shut everything down and wait for your power to come back on. It's saved me so many times. Um, super, super important. Um, internal storage is something you should consider at this level too when you're rendering files that are so big. Um, okay, on to the next one. There's two... Well, there's three operating systems in the world. There's two that are the ones I would use. Linux, I'm not even going to touch. I'm not even going to talk about. It's for, for servers and storage and all this stuff. Um, it's I don't know that much about it, and it's not worth mentioning here. Uh, so Mac and Windows, two big things. With uh, your mac os computers you've got a lot of pros especially for us in the like creative industry do they really have linux artist environment is that that's real that's crazy it's i mean as far as like usage like if you have to just keep something really efficient run it in linux i guess so oh not gonna be me um so with Mac computers, the best thing about them, I find, is you're paying for the package that is an Apple product, meaning you don't really have to worry about what's inside of it once you've bought it. You buy what it tells you it has in it, and you kind of set it and forget it. You don't really have to troubleshoot it um, on your end. But the con of that is that when something does go wrong, it's kind of hard to fix hardware in them yourself or without involving like Apple support. And I know it can be like crazy. Um, yes, yeah, so Jared, that's a good point with memory um, in Houdini. It all depends on the chips, which I'm gonna get into in a second. Um, but uh, yeah, another, another big thing to point out here is that Mac OS, they natively handle Apple ProRes codec, which like everyone should know about and use frequently because it's a very good codec. Um, but another downside of it is it's really ex they're really expensive because you're paying for that premium of like, I don't need to worry about how the machine functions. I know it can handle what I want it to do, right? Um, and I can skip over some of these other ones. Linux is more standard than Windows. That's scary. <laughs> yeah, but, it like a, but it is a sub. At, at yeah. VFX Studios, I should disclaim, not in like post production in general, just VFX. Okay, that's good to know. And like, is Adobe Suite is still non Linux, right? It's just OS, uh, Mac OS, and, and Windows, I'm pretty sure. I believe so. I don't think there's 
anything Linux for uh, Adobe. Um, another final thing to say about this is uh, planned obsolescence is real for Mac computers. Uh, they will go out of style is not the right word. They will they will cease functioning the way they used to function after a certain amount of time because the operating system will uh, update itself to be uh, more complex than the actual machine can handle. So that's that's a quite an annoying thing. And then you can't like swap parts to make it work better. Um, so we're going to talk about some Mac processors that happen now. Um, in like, I think it was 2020 or 2019, uh, they stopped pushing new Mac computers with Intel processors, which is what they had been doing pretty steadily for almost the entirety of the Mac computers. They came out with the M1, which is now discontinued, so I'm not even going to talk about it. Uh, the M2 is right now the standard in most of them, but the M3 that came out uh, late last year. Oh, my God, it's Sadie. Um Ethan's dog, everyone. This is an M3 right here. <laughs> Distracted, it's fine. Yeah, that's an M3? Yep. Oh, amazing. M3 Max laptop. Okay. Okay. Oh, um, balling out here. Uh, I got balls on sale. Yeah, that you, that's a good point. I, I have an M2 Pro Max, I don't remember, um, for my laptop. Uh. Basically, the M3 is kind of new, so there's not as many products yet, but if you buy a new one, you can, um, if you buy a new Mac, they'll usually now have the M3, but like some of them have M2. It will start to phase out the M2 with time. Um, and then I'm just going to do a little chart here so we can understand the difference because there's a lot of like terminology that they throw around that they don't um distinguish between and that is on purpose to confuse you and make you think like oh it says ultra so it must be better than the max or it's the third one so it has to be better than the second one and that like that is true um but overall the m3s tend to perform about like 17 percent better than the m2s which is good but you also have to consider that the m2 has like i'm making these numbers up like 2 billion transistors in its CPU. And then the M3 has like 2.4 billion. So like it is better, but it is that's a lot of transistors. That's a lot of processing power with the M2. And right now you can't go wrong with an M2. Give it like five years and then you could probably go wrong with it. But um, the other thing about Mac computers is that most of them, with the exception of the Mac Pro, which I don't talk about here, uh, have an integrated graphics processing unit inside the CPU that includes the Mac Studio. So it's all in one kind of like chip bay, which is different than the way graphics cards typically run as like a chunky part that you put into the computer. Um, any questions on these? Because these are confusing. Well, there's uh, what's significant about the um, change to the M architecture. It is a big change. Do you know the answer? Just yeah. <laughs> not the well, was, we're on we're on, we're on Intel standard like x86 platform forever, mm -hmm. and then. Um, and then this is like represents a like a fundamental change. Like basically, it's like cell phone ARM processor architecture. So uh, first in the jump, there's a lot of like plug-in incompatibility issues. Software companies, of course, because of the market caught up, but there is still some of that, some compatibility stuff. It's pretty minor anymore, though. Yeah, I remember when the M1 came out. We were we worked remote in uh, Dropbox, and then once started people started getting M1 chips. Dropbox did not mess with that like they just were like you know what we're not supporting it until we can get it right so some people couldn't work for like a month until they could figure it out um doesn't apple make them also isn't that like sort of the big yes, thing it's their, it's they got... their, their chip it's yeah not they got like a the vertical chip. integration there whatever it's called 
yes um trying to really bring you all into the apple ecosystem which uh i mean for better or worse for for better that like most of it works out of the box straight up no problems for the most part bad in that then they kind of own everything i yeah. like my pc but i had a lot less problems with my mac i yeah. feel like when i was at least with adobe i get crashes all the time mm -hmm. so yeah, Adobe's kind of tailor made for Mac and vice versa. Like, if you want a nice, smooth experience uh, with Adobe products, Macs, in my experience, tend to perform better. But cost for performance premium, of course. Um. Yes, totally agreed. Um. Which brings me to Windows. Um. The biggest pro to having a Windows computer, not a, not necessarily a laptop. I'm just going to talk about desktops. You have pretty much entire freedom of customization. So you can add or subtract parts at will and have a working computer. Now you have to like take in some, some considerations of like, does this form factor fit the motherboard? Does this RAM speed work with my CPU? Does my GPU need more power to draw out? Do I need a better, better power supply to be able to support that? Those are all things. So it, it takes a little bit of technical knowledge um, and understanding to like help um, a Windows be as effective as as a Mac, um, but it is cheaper and it is easier to future proof when you get um, the ability to change stuff out. Um, you don't have to buy a whole new computer when uh, you're like, oh, my GPU is starting to get outdated. You can take it apart, do some research on if you're your CPU supports it or not, typically yes. Um, and then basically plug it in, run some drivers. Uh, another thing I, I was I was reading and, and uh, understanding, I just got a, um, a 21 by nine monitor. So it's like huge. Um, Mac computers have a hard time scaling past 4K on monitors that aren't Mac monitors, which is interesting. Um, but Windows handles it very well. So, I mean, if you're working on a bigger monitor, it's it's nicer and easier to not even have to worry about it or seeing like any sort of resolution compression. Um, another thing I should mention is uh, Windows are great for gaming. Uh, if you like to play games like myself, um, it's good or it's good. It gives you the ability not just to work on your machine, but also like do your hobby or whatever. Um, bad things, no pro res at all, unless you have Adobe, which gives you the codec. Um, yes, you can pay, Eric, you're right. You can pay money for that. I don't know if you have any more insight. Uh, yes, because, uh, when I was a VFX editor at Fuse, uh, the program that we would use was assimilate scratch. And we use those on Windows machines, but we had ProRes support. Okay. But that's like $1,600 of a program. But a hack, uh, if you have DaVinci Resolve and you have a studio license, uh, not only can you also get a Fusion license because you can basically do a two-for-one thing with your license, mm -hmm. uh, while you can't export ProRes in Resolve itself, if you download Fusion and then you just save a file there, you can actually export a ProRes file out of Fusion Studio. Oh, that's cool. I didn't know that. Yeah, I had to do a little bit of a hack thing recently, <laughs> actually, where uh, I rendered out like a high-res DNX file, and then I brought it into Fusion just to render it as a ProRes-specific mm -hmm. file. Mm -hmm. And that was all on Windows. But that's some hoop jumping you have to do if you have a Windows computer and you're not... Yes, that is them. hoop jumping, yes. So in terms of easiness, yeah, you don't have that as easy, but there are workarounds. Well, and for decoding, it's fine. There's open source, right? It's just encoding. That's the mm -hmm. issue with pro. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I can read, not write. Um, okay, custom builds. I kind of talked about this a little bit, but um, this is, to me, the highlight of a Windows computer is the ability to kind of change stuff out as you want. I threw down what I have here. Um, I basically rebuilt this computer like four times with different 
uh, processors and um, graphics cards, RAM and and all that. But uh, there are like day, there are some times of the past like year where like it will stop working for a reason I don't know. And I have to troubleshoot for like an hour or like I had one happen before where like a Windows update like messed up the dry the BIOS driver in my motherboard. So it like wouldn't turn on or it would turn on, but it wouldn't post, which is a term for starting the operating system. Um, and I didn't have the wherewithal to like figure that out. So I brought it to uh, micro center, which I'm going to be micro center's biggest advocate here. You can just take your full build there and you like pay them money to like diagnose it. They'll run the whole thing. They'll like put other cards in to find the problem for you. They'll like basically tell you what it is. Then you can choose to fix it or not based on whatever cost. And then if you do it with them, they give you a discount on the parts that you would buy to fix the problem. So for me, I had a a different issue was I bought a power supply, but it turns out the power supply was like dead on arrival and I didn't know that. So I had to bring it to them. They tested it and they were like, hey, you can buy this one, but we're going to give you like a significant discount because you brought it in to, to be looked at. And that's the nice thing about um, being able to buy parts like that, too, is if something like a power supply is the most common culprit, culprit goes bad, and I've done this before, is you can go to Best Buy, you can buy one immediately on the spot, you can buy the one you actually want online and uh, maybe return that in a day, mm -hmm. but you get the price. Not necessarily the best thing to do, but it's something you can do in a pinch and you can do it immediately, um, which is not something you can do with the Mac. Um, it's often, if it goes down, it's weeks before you have it back. Yeah, because dealing with Apple support and, and Apple is, is particular about if any third party opens their computer, literally, they have a seal inside of it to show that someone else opened it the incorrect way and they don't tell anyone how to open it. And if they see that when you bring it to support, they'll just not help you. They will just give it back to you. So that's Apple support is very good, but you have to like play within their rules. Um to do it mike asks how often do i find myself upgrading parts um that's a good question uh it's probably like every two years and that's like a pretty good timeline um you sometimes it's as easy as like i bought more ram because i realized my computer was not as fast as i want it to be um and that usually goes over smooth a couple years ago i bought a graphics card that has just you know put in the work and and done perfect for me internal storage i swapped out like once over the past year but nothing costing me more than outside of the graphics card nothing costing me more than like a hundred two hundred dollars to like make a significant change in my build that makes it faster um i also find building it is kind of fun and uh I know that makes me uh, maybe an outlier, <laughs> but it's kind of like a, a grown-up puzzle with technology, and I, it's uh, fun to put together. It's stressful at times because when you have an expensive part, you're like, God, I don't want this to break if I push it into this little slot here. But um, to me, that's one of the main advantages of uh, Windows computers. Um, and then I'm going to get into like a little bit of parts, uh, nothing too in-depth, but just so everyone can get on the same page of like what these things do and why they're important. So your CPU, and this is a diagram of a build, this is not mine, and this is a PC. Uh, with Apple, it becomes a little different because you can't really see the inside of them and it's all like, it's, it's like a big chip and it's hard to decipher because they don't tell you. Um, so your CPU is basically the brain. It's one of the more, more important, if not the most important part of your computer. Um, basically, you'll see, especially on the Mac website, uh, the Mac website, the Apple website, cores, it'll say like 16 core, 10 core, 8 core, uh, whatever number core. Those are uh, individually are CPUs, those little cores. So technically the term CPU is kind of fake because it makes you think that this one thing is the one thing, but it's actually made up of multiple different processing units. And what that allows you to do is work on different things at the same time, or allows your computer to work on different things at the same time. 
Um, so it's important if you're, especially if you're uh, in that tier three I was talking about, which is uh, video editing and beyond into visual effects, you're going to want more cores because it allows you to have like multiple things open at the same time and task switch pretty easily. So if you're like, okay, I'm, I'm done with this premiere timeline, I got to switch to After Effects. Enough time to like, like, um, or sorry, if you're going to close Premiere down, reopen uh, After Effects or have them both open at the same time. If you don't have enough cores to support that, it's going to take a bit and be slower and, and kind of annoying. Um, there's a general price range for uh, CPUs that you can buy, uh, mostly for Windows. Um, the Mac, Again, the Mac stuff is all like built into it, so it's hard to gauge exactly how much they value these things at. Um, then your GPU, this is that big fat card I was talking about. Very important for, yeah, that tier three and above where you're going to be actually working with visual uh, images and needing playback of of certain things. Um, it's yeah, it's good for hashtag gamers. Um, everyone talks about, you know, the NVIDIA GTX, the NVIDIA blah, blah, blah. I mean, the 40 series came out last year and then like no one bought it because it uh, underperforms. But um but they do AI, so everyone's buying their stock. Anyway, I'm not a huge NVIDIA fan, even though I have one of their cards. Um, these can get really pricey, especially when uh, people who mine Bitcoin. This is um, this was the big one of the bigger issues during COVID is when uh, mining for Bitcoins became like popular. People were buying up GPUs just to like shove them in a rack and just continue to crank out. Uh, numbers and and um, I, I'm not gonna pretend to understand Bitcoin, but Frank, they were mining, all right. You just just trust me on that, um, and that's why they were so uh, expensive for a while. And they, and they can get up, they can get more than this, but uh, for most of us, I don't think we need to be spending more than like two thousand dollars on a uh GPU. The Bitcoin mining uh, thing is a big reason to avoid um, used gear these days uh, for uh, GPUs, especially. Is yeah, they get <laughs> worn to uh, to hell uh, by these people running them constantly. Yeah, that's a good point. A lot of this I'm talking about is for new equipment. I really, unless you know the person you're buying the the equipment from well, I wouldn't buy used parts um maybe the only scenario i could see you buying a used part from a random person is if like they've got like a, a internal storage spinning disk that you're just gonna throw things you don't care on like like your cash from your um uh, premiere or after effects or whatever program you're running like maybe but anything else i really would not even bother yeah um you just don't understand the wear and tear that has happened to it. And that's that's always a cause for concern. Um, okay, and then we're at RAM, which it, RAM is similar to the CPU and that allows you to do tasks faster. But basically what happens is when you're using a program, it needs to store data instantaneously. And the larger you have, the larger your RAM is, and it's usually measured in gigabytes, um, I can't wait for the day it's in terabytes. You are going to have faster uh, programs basically because of higher speed of RAM. And then there's, there's a couple things about RAM. They Apple calls it unified memory. So if you go on their site right now and you try to buy a computer, it will not say RAM. It will say unified memory. This is what they mean. They're trying to confuse you with uh, internal memory so you can be like I need the highest number while that might be true you need the highest number they don't really disclose what the speed of the RAM is so there's a there's a speed associated with it for this one uh, the computer I'm running now it's like uh, rated as like DDR and then a number so right now it's a DDR4 for me um, I think there's six is out maybe um, but in doing so, you have to like make sure your motherboard is like up to, up to snuff with a DDR6 compatible speed and your and your CPU. So um, I can show you guys a tool later that I use to like make sure that things are compatible with each other. 
Um, so that's the RAM. Internal storage, also very important. I didn't really talk about it too much. Um, you need multiple, you need a good amount of internal storage to do a lot of things. Number one, you need it for your operating system, which takes up a certain amount of space. And you want, to, you want enough space available for your operating system to then do updates and change around uh, where it's allocated data. Um, you're also going to obviously need it for a place to put your files. Um, and I use a method that I stole from Jack in 2019, where he uses a hard drive just for cash. And so that is the place that all those live. It's an SSD, so it's accessed quickly. And I don't have to worry about it. And it's all garbage. And I can basically just like cycle it out whenever I need and not worry about like where those cache files are going. Are they speed? Are they slowing down my processor because they're on the main drive of the computer? So um, yeah, it speeds up After Effects pretty quickly. Um, I recommend one terabyte for everyone. I know that's like, if you heard me saying that five years ago, you would think I'm crazy. But now it's like, I have a I have a couple one terabyte drives and I'm like that's not enough. It's it's simply not enough. Um, so I would recommend at least one terabyte for files. Especially if you play games. Especially you play games. You play that's games. like four games and that's it. Like uh, what Baldur's Gate three is like 150 gigabytes or something. Like that's ridiculous. And you don't want drives to be like full if you can avoid them. Yes. I, I I'm pretty sure. I have this right, but like they work better, especially your OS drive. If you like give it some breathing room to like, you know, I don't know what the optimum number is, but like 60, 70% full. I was going to say, I think it reaches at. maximum of like 80 to 85% mm -hmm. full, ideally. Yeah. Sometimes I don't you know. can push it to 90, but that's again, pushing it. Exactly. I don't know what the computer science reason is, but it just like helps it. Yeah, I mean, if if we're talking Same. about spinning disks, what they used to do is like imagine a circle, right? And it's a concentric circle going in. There's little blocks of data in that circle that that needle has to move to find whatever. If it's all full, it has to like literally go through everything to find thing. So it's like trying to get somewhere, but you have to walk through like tall grass to get there versus like flat land I, that's a really terrible analogy <laughs> but that's kind of why you need that wiggle room with your with your os drive um and for those updates it will like rip, like it will rip stuff out and put new stuff in and shift it all down um a helpful tool to like deal with stuff when you're when you're uh realizing like slow playback especially on a, a windows is to defragment your hard drives uh occasionally which will basically say like when you have a map of data let's say that's called a tetris grid right and you remove you delete a file somewhere down here there's a hole here but in order to get there it still has to go through all that stuff so defragging basically reorganizes it all so it can be in a compact little spot and not have to work so hard to find xyz so i recommend doing it like once a week um for windows i don't know what the process is for mac i think there's one and it might just do it by itself yeah it's the at the way the operating system works is entirely different so it doesn't have the same addressing issues that okay. uh, windows has. some advantages you do that for... once a week you yeah said? usually yeah. i just select oh, all wow. my hard drives and hit go and if you're on top of it it only takes like five minutes but if, if you done haven't done it ever. in a while then it'll it'll definitely take some time all right. For most so people, if you're running start. Windows, just do a fresh install of the operating system and yeah. be treated. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so, yep, all those things are the generic uh, parts to make your computer. Um, so these are just a couple of general costs. Um, don't take my word for all of these. Um but this is based off like looking at the Apple site versus like builds you can get. You see that the Mac OS is like significantly more expensive. This is what we were talking about earlier, but also there's huge ranges here because you can customize how much internal storage you have. You can customize how much RAM you have. You can customize the processor you have and all those things tack on an additional fee, both in terms of uh, Mac and Windows. Um, the ceiling for Windows is a little is is lower because you can get 
uh, in my experience, better performance out of a custom build that has like the highest end GPU and CPU um, than you can the highest end Mac at the current moment in time. Yeah, bang for buck, exactly. Um, and then I have a couple recommendations. Uh, when when this gets sent out, all of these are hyperlinks. I'm not going to click them now, but uh, for uh, importantly, I'm just going to talk about uh, tiers three and four. Um, the Mac Pro is the cheese grater, and the cheese grater is really good. It is just at its most ten thousand dollars. So if you want to basically buy a new car. <laughs> you can buy a Mac Pro and you can be set for years. Now, I don't know. They've only been around for like seven years, six, seven years. You think you can get them higher than that? Yeah, probably. Um, so I don't know like how long they last yet. Um, but conversely, you can get a Windows that you can change stuff out. And I I put an example here of a pre-build that includes a Threadripper, which is like AMD's the number one reason AMD is in the creative space for professionals, I would say, is probably Threadripper um, as the processor because it is truly insane. Um, when I worked at Conan, all the graphics people had custom-built PCs that all had dual <laughs> Threadrippers installed and, and all that stuff. Um, any questions? No. Yeah, like in, in the chat, we're just talking about how weird it is. Some of these RAM configurations on Macs where they're not like power of two, like, you know, 8, 16, 32, 64. Like, it's like, what's up with 18 gigs of RAM? Yeah, like, I think I it's know. just the way they have compartmentalized the RAM inside the, the machine is like different than traditional. Yeah, because mine has 36. It's like, yeah, it is not strange. that it makes a difference all that much, but it's just an interesting thing they did. Yeah, because typically, so you think of that memory in those calculations, or how does that work? I don't know. Seems like there is there like, is that just just the, the RAM RAM, or is there like multiple flavors within that? That is a 36. Good, that is a good question. I don't know. Yeah, because yeah, that would make it. sense. That would make sense if they're including the speed of the GPU as well since it's built in that's a good question yes. anyway moving on I've got some faqs that i made up this is the um what do they call this the straw man argument question i, I made a person <laughs> up <laughs> ask question um if you're working remote what do you need you need to edit from a bay that is miles away from you from home uh really truly that is your internet speed is is most important and i would recommend anything over 300 megabytes per second if you megabits per second if you can get it um if you're lucky enough to live somewhere with horizon files then you don't need to worry about anything and you can just you know run your gigabit internet um, but you do need a, a pretty decent CPU to be able to handle whatever program you're using to remote into that computer. So sometimes it's jump desktop. Sometimes it's, um, I've used Chrome remote desktop a couple of times. It's not amazing, but um, jump is the big one. I know there's one other big one I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, and then I'm a hashtag gamer and I want to play games as well. Uh, all the gamer related parts are also very good for creative work. So don't be scared by the RGB lights. Um, just for your sanity, try to avoid the <laughs> the RGB lights. Um, th that being said, specifically with monitors and other peripherals like speakers and mice and keyboards and stuff, there is a little bit of a like gamer premium they tack on there. So for example, I was in the um, market to get a new monitor because mine died. Um, LG sells a model that is larger than the one I have um, with a higher resolution for like half the, not half the cost. It was like two thirds of the cost. Um, and they don't tell you really what the difference is, but it's the way that 
pixels work is different and specific to gaming and the refresh rate is the is not what you need for creative work um as well as the um oh my god what am i the, the color accuracy is not there out of the box otherwise you'd have to get it um calibrated which is a whole thing and involves a little machine and doing a thing so like you're better off with peripherals going for creative um, based stuff but a lot of the like uh, graphics cards and ram and uh, cpu and cases too for building a, a windows custom um, that are gamer related are good for this um, like I, i'm pretty sure my video card is like gamer something um if you use Adobe every day, I would say most of it relies only on your CPU and your RAM, which is really counterintuitive because it's a a um a graphics software, which is crazy. Um, yes, Eric, I I will address Nvidia drivers. Um, I just saw that. Uh, you should have a good GPU, regardless, but it's okay to go a lower model if you're going to go higher on your um, CPU and your RAM. Uh, your GPU, however, for Resolve is the most important thing. Um, it does not lean that heavily on your CPU, but mostly on your graphics card and your RAM. So if you're, if you're mixing between the two, just you know go for a blanket and get them all at a pretty decent quality. Um, if you're using Unreal Engine, uh, it runs much smoother on a windows i don't know exactly why that is but that is the case um i think it's how the it's like hard. yeah what was that so Sorry. the um nvidia uh, rtx architecture since the graphics are amd on mac um like rtx for real-time ray tracing uh what direct the current direct x is all going to be windows based so if that's what you're uh gun in for for your career or that's what you do a lot um i would recommend windows computer for sure um and this one is a question that shana asked so i guess it's not a made-up question but uh <laughs> if you're using a laptop and you want that render power there are some options uh specifically in the form of eGPUs, which didn't really catch on a couple years ago when resolve released their own thing as far as i can tell they're pretty a good way to boost your render speed once you're done with the product but um actually using it in real time would probably depend on like the cable that connects it to the port in which your laptop would be connected in um i'm sure there's some good ones now but i know that that resolve one got some pretty bad reviews when it came out yeah. I also, I don't think they're mm -hmm. optimized very well for uh, M1. I don't think they're supported for M1. Yeah, that's a good point because that was before the M1 chip. Yep. Well, and the and the kind of uh, conundrum there too is that most of the like the good cable performance like you're talking about interface is Thunderbolt, so it's mm -hmm. like the, it's kind of a contradiction. But um, that was the limiting factor I think in a lot of PCs using uh, eGPUs was just the speed of the port to to support it thunderbolt yeah. yeah for sure um and then to circle back on eric's stuff about drivers yeah nvidia when you get an nvidia graphics card you should probably install the drivers um, or else it won't work properly um yeah you can you can choose whether to install like a gaming driver or a studio driver you can't have both technically at the same time I don't really know the performance difference in either. I stick with the studio ones because that's what I use this mostly for. Um, I don't have the uh, the patience to switch my driver entirely to the game one, open up a game, and then compare it to what I had on the studio one because everything works fine anyway. Yeah. Choose the one depending on what you do more. Yeah. Well, and is it, it's probably the difference like between um, like Quadro, like workstation cards and RTX cards where like the gaming stuff is more tuned for like performance, like sheer performance, whereas the workstation stuff is often tuned for stability mm -hmm. um, where you have 
same specs, but it'll run slightly, you know, cooler and more efficiently with studio stuff. And you pay a premium for that too. That's a good point. Um, so this, when this goes out, these are all hyperlinked. A uh, couple places to buy pre-built. NZXT is a is a gamer branded one, but they do some pretty good work at a at an okay price. It's a little expensive, but they do build it for you and ship it to you, which is great. Um, Ironside is another one. They're a little bit um more expensive than NZXT, but they do some really solid work. One thing to watch out for them though is a lot of their stuff is always out of stock. So check <laughs> before you commit. And uh if you really want one of their builds, they do some they should do some really cool, like artful um custom builds that are really interesting to look at if that's what you're into. Um but otherwise uh Puget is is a pretty pretty solid brand to uh build your stuff for you and they're very responsive to like what you want to add or take away um they're pretty good um uh, micro center again shout out they've helped me like three or four times when i have had you know hours of pulling parts out not to solve the problem myself and then i bring it to them they solve it in an hour um with micro center you can actually go up to them and have them build you a pc and they'll give you an estimate of what each part is going to cost and the total cost when you get to the end and compare it to what you would have bought the parts yourself for and built it, it's actually a lot cheaper for them to build it for you. Like they cut you a deal on a lot of stuff. I have a a friend who asked me to help him build stuff and he showed me the parts list of what Micro Center was charging him and he was getting like a i7 for like $200 cheaper than he would have if he just bought it himself. So hmm. it's it's starting to change in that pre-built are more worth your money than um then oh then not um you don't get the fun of building it yourself but if you're trying to save money and not worry about like the technical aspect of it i would definitely consider a pre-built yeah in volume buy because they, they i'm sure at retail price it's more expensive msrp is um going to be more expensive than the wholesale um, I just got my pre-built from Micro Center. Like I didn't do the building thing. I just bought one from them and oh, yeah. they're pretty good. I got one in 2021. So it was like a really bad time to buy them. It's like the only way I could get a computer. Um, but they're nice because they have one at like every price point from like a thousand dollars to like two thousand dollars. And you can just say like, all right, or like even, you know, I want to spend seventeen hundred. They have one for seventeen hundred. Or if you like, oh, I want a little bit more, get the eighteen hundred one. So they're pretty good. Um one thing I'll say about my pre built is that like it's got kind of a weird motherboard. So it doesn't have as much room for expansion. Um that's really the only problem that I've run into with it. Uh and it's got kind of a crappy CPU for what I did because it's like a game. Mm-hmm. Oh, we lost you, Ethan. Turned into a robot. <laughs> That's the Go back. CPU is really fighting you on that comment. <laughs> uh, it's definitely a good option. It's definitely a good option. You don't want to have to build it yourself. You don't want to have to build a computer yourself. Wait, what's the last thing you heard? Whoa. <laughs> and he's Is gone. He... God, no, no, he's back. He's here. Mm. He's he needed a reboot. I think we caught him. Wow. They, they, didn't, they didn't want me to get that information out there. There's no. some, <laughs> some anti micro center chills in the internet. <laughs> um yeah i agree I, they they're also like when i go to them they know what they're talking about like the people you're interfacing with are the customer support are the people who are actually building it so if you have any knowledge of how you built it so for me it's like i went in and i i did all the wires and i'm like oh it could be this or this or this i think i looked at this and they go oh, yeah i understand like this could be the issue because of this and this and this and this they they're at least the one in brooklyn is pretty nice sometimes they'll the the wait time can be a little long, but um, highly recommend if there's a micro center near you, just like pop it in if you're curious on on buying a new machine. Um, and then PC Part Picker is like 
a Bible, I would say. It's so, so, so ridiculously helpful. Um, you can virtually build your machine. So you can say like, this is the CPU I want. It'll go into like the fake CPU slot. You can add your GPU, your RAM, whatever. And it will tell you basically if there are any compatibility issues down to the size of your GPU might not fit in the case you bought. So I, PC part picker is like really, really helpful. For me, it's where I save all my parts lists. So I have every computer I've built is like as a, including the one when I upgraded, I make a new one every time. So I can instantly be like, I know that this part is what I have in here without having to like take apart my computer and find out. I really like PC part picker. Um, the only thing I don't like is they don't source enough price point comparisons when they when they talk about price. Um, they usually only look at Best Buy, Newegg, and Amazon. Um, maybe they added B and H recently. I'm not sure. But otherwise, it's it's a fantastic website. You can also just like you can publicly release your builds. And I know I'm running short on time. I'm basically done. But um, you can make your parts pu your part list public, so you can like look at other people's builds for inspiration, or be like, "Oh, I want I want a computer with an i seven. I should just look at other builds uh, that have an i seven and see like does it work well, right?" And there's comment section, there's all this stuff. So I'm a big fan of PC Part Picker, um, and then just place to buy parts, Micro Center, obviously, but Amazon, Best Buy, and B and H. Um, I word of warning amazon can be hit or miss like i have had parts come in like that power supply dead on arrival that doesn't work the plus side is you can just say hey that didn't work and give it back to them and they'll give you a full refund no question um i don't really know B uh, best buys return policy but bnh is also very good at it and most of their uh not most every time i've ordered from bnh i have not had a problem with the part and same with Micro Center, they they uh they'll stand by it, and if if it doesn't work, they'll just give you a new one, no hassle. And that's it. I know that was a that was a sprint, <laughs> but uh, but info. Anyone... Oh oh, also Shana just messaged me. Uh, I think it's next week or the week after is Passover, so B and H will not be open if you're trying to buy anything. They will be. Very not open for a week and a half, I believe. Mazel tov. Yes, Mazel tov, as they should be. All right, that's it. Any questions? Ah. Sick. Loved it. It's great. great. Slick stack, too. Love your design. That's very <laughs> inviting. I'm a, I'm, a, design. I'm a big Canva fan. I like I like what Canva can do. It can do it quick. It's like if you took Illustrator and PowerPoint and combined them together. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a fan. Oh, and it even told me thank you for watching my own thing. All right. Well, I'm going to stop that now. Love it. <laughs>